Hi, my name is Markus Biel. I'm a software craftsman with 14 years of experience in Java development. Today I would like to talk about hexagonal architecture. This talk is actually based on a talk from Chris Vidal, a PHP developer, and also influenced a bit by a talk from Robert C. Martin. I have the links to both talks and the references at the end of the talk. Okay, let's start. First of all, let's talk about the motivation for the hexagonal architecture. Um, we try to improve the maintainability with hexagonal architecture because it is very important that we can do easy changes and that we can change the software very fast. Um, the faster we can make changes, of course, the less time it needs us and so our system can be developed faster and cheaper. Um, so the more the technical depth increases, the lower is our maintainability. And hexagonal architecture wants to improve that with the use of layers, just as well as many other architectures. Okay, so now let's have a look. Here we see the hexagon. The hexagonal architecture, as you might guess, is called hexagonal architecture because of this image here, the hexagon. So the hexagon is a symbol with six sides, as you see here, and uh, they represent actually six different ways of communicating with the system. As of today, you actually can communicate n times, so any number of times with the system, but this is how hexagonal architecture was named hexagonal architecture anyway. So we have different layers as said. Here you can see framework, application and domain. Uh, Chris Vidal even speaks of core domain, but for me it's both the same, so I just use domain. Um, actually, hexagonal architecture is a perfect fit for domain-driven design. Um, so if you know what domain-driven design is, perfect. So you would use domain-driven design here in the red layer in the domain. But if you don't know domain-driven design, it doesn't matter. You can use hexagonal architecture even without domain-driven design. Just know that they're both a perfect fit. So, okay. So we have these layers and now let's go through each of them. But anyway, first of all, let's have a look at the outside. So our system would remotely communicate with any number of remote systems in any kind of format like REST, HTTP, binary, SOAP, SQL or it could also communicate with other hexagonal systems. For example, uh, especially if you have a big system, um, you can actually split your system up into different hexagonal architectures that communicate remotely which is a great way of enabling um, greater teams to split up and to parallelly work on different parts of the system. Okay. Now, framework. This is the first layer of our hexagonal architecture. The framework layer is called framework layer because this is the place um, where usually the framework would sit if you use a framework. I mean, um, you don't need to use a framework. This is totally up to you. So to phrase it differently, this is the place where the communication coming from outside, as you saw before here. So this is the place that transfers the incoming stream to an object that we can work on. In the case of HTML, for example, uh, HTTP communication, for example, um, you would you could have a controller here that would then um, provide a request and response object that you could work on. 
So let's have a look at an example here. This is an example written in Java. So you could have an HTTP controller extending some kind of a base controller. Not necessarily, but here this is just my example. Um, you would have a process method that would receive request and response. Actually, I meant HTTP request and HTTP response, but so that it fits on the slide, I just wrote request and response. Um, and so we would retrieve parameters taken from the request, would wrap them in a command. A command is actually a pattern from the gang of four, a design pattern. I hope you know it. If not, maybe just look it up on the web. So we wrap um, parameters in a command and then we forward this command to a command bus. So what is a command bus actually? Let's have a look. The command bus is in the application layer. And the application layer, as you can see here, sits right in the middle between domain and framework. <clears throat> so what is inside the application layer besides the command bus, which I actually already mentioned. So the application layer contains everything that is not specific to a certain technology anymore. So it's not specific to HTTP, not specific to REST, SOAP, and so on. But it's also not domain specific yet. So it's like a man in the middle layer, you could say. Okay, now let's have a look. Here we see the command bus. And uh, we have an execute method that takes the command that before in the controller we created. And this command gets forwarded to its specific handler. So for each command, we would have a specific handler. A command um, could be, for example, add user. So it's an abstract form of something that needs to get done, a use case. And for this example, for an add user command, you would have an add user handler. Now you need some kind of a strategy to find out which handler is going to handle which command. In my case, I use the registry, which is another design pattern. But you could also do it in any other simple way, like using reflection and then just when the command is called add user, you could have a string replace and then have a handler add user handler and forward to this handler. And then we call the execute method on the handler. Okay. So next layer is the domain layer. So the domain layer contains all the domain logic and also constraints. What is a constraint? Constraint here is represented by the invalid gear exception. So everything the domain is not able to do. So in this example here, I have a class car that provides a method drive. And if the domain logic says um, you're not allowed to drive with that gear, an invalid gear exception is thrown. And this exception will bubble up all the way to the top into the framework where it's handled once. Um, handled, for example, could mean that uh, it's locked on our side and then forwarded in a specific format. For example, in SOAP would be a SOAP fold. In REST, it could just be a REST message indicating the error to the client. Okay, so actually hexagonal architecture is also called ports and adapters. 
So why is it called ports and adapters? Ports and adapters. So we have ports and the adapters are perfectly fitting into those ports. The ports are like the sides of our hexagon. So the ports are the different technical formats that our system supports. And the adapters are like each layer is an adapter for the layer around it, you could say. Or you could also phrase it as an adapter is the implementation and a port is an interface. Because something very important about hexagonal architecture is its interfaces. Because with the interfaces we encapsulate the system. No, we don't encapsulate it, but we um, we have it maintainable so that each layer is separated by itself. Okay, so now um, I already talked shortly about use cases. A command like make call, receive call, or send SMS. I mean, a use case in our hexagonal architecture is represented as a use case. And the good thing about this is you implement your command, your use case once, and then you're totally agnostic of the specific technical implementation. One team can focus and can design on the use cases without the system being actually finished, while another team can already start implementing the te technical ports that are coming into the system, independent of a specific use case. Okay, so here again we see the hexagon and the different layers. So I already talked about interfaces and how interfaces are important for our, our hexagonal architecture. Actually, each layer protects itself with a boundary from the outer layer around it. Yeah, so here, this is also something I have kind of taken from Chris Vidal. We see the Chinese wall. I think the Chinese wall is a very nice example of a boundary. Uh, it protected the Chinese for hundreds of years. Um, and this is the same idea in our hexagonal architecture that each layer is protected from the layer around it. So that the dependencies are coming from outside in. And so the domain is independent of the application and the application is independent of the framework. So how do we achieve that actually? We achieve that with inversion of control or dependency injection, which you probably have heard of already. So in C Sharp, as well as in Java, for example, you have dependency injection, for example, with annotations or with the help of in Spring, like you can also define an XML context file that sets up your dependency injection. However, this is a bit problematic because then again, your system is not independent from, I mean, the different classes, the different beans you set up are not independent of each other, or at least they are dependent on the framework, in this case, Spring and they should not be. So I don't know about C Sharp, but I do know about Spring. In version 4 of Spring, it's possible to set up context classes and then really your different services and classes you set up don't contain any code and neither any annotations and so they're totally agnostic of any framework in the domain, which is really great and the way it should be. 
Okay, so as said before, in hexagonal architecture, we do need interfaces. Interfaces are really a big thing in hexagonal architecture. This is the way we stay independent so that each layer is independent of the next one. So this is the interface for command bus that takes a command. And this, another example, is the interface for the command handler. Okay, we're almost done. I have two sentences that I want to cite from Robert C. Martin that I really liked. A good architecture maximizes the number of decisions not made. Think about it. Because this really keeps us flexible. And a good architecture allows major decisions to be deferred. Because the best decisions are the ones that are done as late as possible. Because only then you have all the information available. So this is how interfaces help us. With the use of interfaces, we can defer the decision to the latest possible time. Okay, last but not least, the references. So the first one is, as I already mentioned, uh, a talk from Chris Fidal. Really great stuff. Should really look it up. Um, he has put up all his slides. You can see his uh, presentation on YouTube and he has a huge site. It's actually a bit hidden, but if you scroll down on this link, there is heaps of information about hexagonal architecture. And second, a talk from Robert C. Martin about what he calls clean architecture in design, but it's really much related to hexagonal architecture, I would say. Okay, these slides you can find on marcusbeal.com hexagonal architecture pptx. Okay, thank you.